Among the millions of casualties produced in the Vietnam War, more than 900,000 survived their injuries, thanks to the uncommon dedication and bravery of a relatively small group of men known as Dust Off. They flew the most dangerous missions in South Vietnam to evacuate wounded troops from the battlefield and to keep them alive long enough to receive more thorough medical care. This is the incredible story of the men who volunteered to fly those missions, the dangers they faced, sacrifices they made, pain they suffered, and the lives they saved. In Vietnam, all helicopter pilots followed one golden rule. Never fly over the same area twice, especially if you had come under fire the first time. That rule was especially true for landing zones, or LZs, where enemy troops routinely ambushed vulnerable chopper crews. On April 12, 1964, that rule was defied, with tragic consequences for a young H-21 pilot named John Givan. That day, Lieutenant Givan was transporting a load of South Vietnamese troops to a district capital that had been taken over by communist Viet Cong forces. As soon as the troops had been offloaded, the empty transport struggled to regain altitude, but then spun around and flew directly across the LZ. The fire directed on us by the VC was overwhelming. You could hear it, it just like popcorn machines going off everywhere. At about the time the altimeter read 400 feet, I thought, this is too good to be true. We might make it. Well, just a few seconds after that, literally, everything from just about right here below my knee uh, was in little bitty pieces of meat, bone, and blood dripping from the top of the cockpit. Givan was rushed to a nearby staging area in a dust-off chopper piloted by Major Charles Kelly. The crew was met by Captain James Ralph, a flight surgeon who recognized the severity of Givan's condition and immediately began treating his wounds. This footage was taken as the men frantically prepared to evacuate Givan to Saigon. The um, uh, artery had retracted up into his Fine. There's no way I could get to it, nothing I could clamp, so I had to pack several gauze dressings in there and just hold them with my thumbs. We um, took off, went to altitude, and, and he passed out. He was kind of in and out of it anyway, but he was, went from uh, white to gray at that point. I told the pilot, we gotta stay at treetop level. The pilot, Major Kelly, descended to preserve what little oxygen flow remained in Gavan's bloodstream. The entire crew was now at risk of coming under fire from enemy gunners. Givan had a slim chance of surviving, but only if his condition could be stabilized and if he could receive thorough trauma care within minutes. In a desperate attempt to reduce blood loss, Captain Ralph continued to grasp Givan's open wound until he was in surgery. He was the closest to dying of anyone I, I took care of in, in Vietnam. He was just, uh, he was worse than pale. He was turning gray. He had, had no, no pulse that you could feel. Unfortunately, the damage to the lower portion of Gavan's right leg was beyond repair. But thanks to the incredible skill and courage of a dust-off crew and the extraordinary efforts of the surgeons and medical staff that attended to his wounds, Gavan's life was saved. During the Korean War, the air ambulance concept was a proven success, and the dust-off helicopter, the Bell UH-1 Huey, was designed especially for medical evacuation. But there was a time when these dedicated dust-off helicopters in Vietnam were almost grounded. That was before Major Charles Kelly, the pilot who evacuated Lieutenant Givan, arrived in country in January of 1964. Kelly was the third commander of the 57th Medical Detachment, 
a small field evacuation unit that was sent to Vietnam in early 62. When he took command, the unit was virtually under siege by senior level brass. They thought that a dedicated unit of air ambulances was a waste of a most precious commodity, helicopters. Kelly's first order of business was to confront the unit's detractors and to prove them wrong. Kelly came back to us and he says, let me tell you something, they don't wish us well. They want our aircraft. So the only way we're gonna keep them is to prove that nobody else can do what we do better than we do. The 57th had amassed an impressive record of evacuations, despite numerous political and operational obstacles. But Kelly instilled a new sense of urgency in crews and made several dramatic operational changes. First, Kelly taught his crews never to refuse a mission, never to come home without the patient, and always to put the safety of the wounded first. He then split the detachment and relocated two of the choppers to Sok Trang, in the middle of Vietnam's expansive delta, where Viet Cong activity was rapidly increasing. Radio communication was extremely unreliable, so Kelly directed his crews not just to wait for evacuation requests, but to actually seek out new business. In an extremely bold move, Kelly himself also began flying at night. Each evening, he set off on a 400-mile circuit to recover wounded troops and civilians that he knew would be out there. Frequently, he arrived home in a chopper that was full of holes and spurting gas. Most pilots were soon flying more than 150 hours a month, even though they were supposed to be grounded if they flew more than 100. The value and appreciation of dust-off crews grew immensely under Kelly's command. Dust-off came to represent a ray of humanity and hope in an increasingly brutal and inhumane conflict. They set a standard that will be hard to match in anybody's war. It gave us a very strong feeling of security knowing those medevac guys would be in there to get us. We loved them to death. And we knew particularly that Major Charles L. Kelly would be there. People appreciated him very much because they didn't have to wait till morning uh, to get their people out. And they knew he would come anytime, day or night, whatever the weather was, they didn't have to wait. And that's a great thing for a person to know if there's somebody next to you that's hurt. In a letter to the U.S. Surgeon General, Kelly described the commitment of dust-off crews to their cause. Our job is evacuation of casualties from the battlefield, he wrote. This we are doing day and night, without escort aircraft, and with only one ship for each mission. The other units fly in groups, rarely at night, and are always heavily armed. The strength of Kelly's determination to keep dust-off in the air and his dedication to the wounded on the ground were clear in the daring way he flew. This was the case on July 1st, 1964, when a call for dust off came from a unit near Vinh Long. Approaching the area, Kelly radioed the men on the ground and asked them to mark their position with smoke. As he neared the ground, enemy forces turned their weapons on the large, vulnerable Huey. The advisors on the ground frantically radioed Kelly, warning him to get out of the area as fast as possible. When I have your wounded, he answered. Suddenly, Kelly's Huey pitched upwards, nosed over, and plunged to the earth, the rotors beating into the ground. 
My God, he whispered, as a bullet entered an open cargo door and pierced his heart. Major Charles L. Kelly was the 49th American to die in Vietnam. But his legacy would live on for years to come. Major Charles Kelly did not die in vain. At the time of his death, roughly 18,000 US troops were stationed in Vietnam. By the end of 1966, nearly 400,000 American troops were stationed throughout the country, and the conflict was becoming increasingly bloody. Ultimately, millions of military and civilian personnel would be wounded or killed in a bitter struggle that would last more than a decade. Major Kelly's sacrifice was greeted throughout South Vietnam and the United States by an outpouring of praise and honor that ensured the continued existence of dust-off. His legacy for the conduct of dust-off operations could be summed up by some of the last words he spoke, when I have your wounded, a motto that men like Major Patrick Brady, one of two dust-off pilots to receive the Medal of Honor, took to heart. Raider Alpha 6, Raider Alpha 6, long dust off. The operation shack would get the mission. Well, as soon as the guy came on the radio, dust off, have a mission ready to copy. He'd hit the buzzer, and that alerted the crew, and immediately the co-pilot would head for the aircraft. The pilot would head for the operation shack, and you didn't walk, you ran. And uh, the first thing you wanted was the coordinates and a heading, and with those two bits of information, he would run to the aircraft which would already be running. Co-pilot was started. Everything was ready to go. You're off the ground before three minutes, and you call the guy on the ground right now, as soon as you break ground, because then he stops keeping time. He knows you're on the way. He then is relieved. Initially, Dust-off pilots essentially abandon conventional combat flight precautions in an effort to get to the wounded as fast as possible. Even if there had been time to receive it, information about the location and strength of enemy threats and the number and type of casualties was often unavailable. The only intelligence that we had was that which we found out along the way. We had no intelligence briefing. There wasn't, a, there wasn't time for an intelligence briefing. There wasn't time for flight planning. In the absence of intelligence about enemy threats, pilots developed their own set of defensive flight tactics. Many preferred to fly at treetop level en route to the pickup area. This prevented enemy gunners from finding their mark. Dust-off crews became renowned for their willingness to fly by the seat of their pants, directly into active combat, even at night or in bad weather. In time, the situation improved slightly. Crews began receiving what became known as the essential elements of information. We would be able to write down on a piece of paper the location, radio call sign, radio frequency, number and type of patients, security of the area, physical condition of the area, all these kinds of things that are nice to know if you are a pilot. Although such information was extremely helpful in theory, dust-off crews still had to venture into the unknown virtually every time they set off on a mission. One of the most significant problems lay in the fact that men who were immersed in the confusion and trauma of combat were often prone to providing inaccurate information. Oftentimes, the guy on the ground didn't know where he was. And he'd give you a set of coordinates uh, that, you know, you get there, he is nobody there. While crews could usually pinpoint the location of troops by homing in on their radio signal, there were other more significant problems. One of the most difficult involved the prioritization of patients. Various categories of precedence, ranging from urgent to priority to routine, were supposed to be assigned to patients 
based on the length of time that they would likely be able to survive. In reality, though, many patients drew urgent classifications based on their pain rather than on the severity of their condition. Ground commanders were anxious to see that any wounded man was taken out as soon as possible. This often limited Dustoff's ability to evacuate those who needed help most. It made no sense at all. You know, you could have both legs blown off and not necessarily be urgent because your limbs are gone already. And if you're stable, you live for a long time. So I said there are two kinds of patients, an urgent patient and a non-urgent patient. Now, if you got them day or night, we're going to come and get them right now. But we need to know urgent or non-urgent so that we can, in fact, best allocate our resources. The security of a pickup area was perhaps the most bewildering information that dust off received from the field. Ground troops were supposed to assess security so that the crews could determine how or even if they could get in and out of an area safely. But every crew knew that ground forces were hard pressed to assess the relative security of any area. They also knew that enemy troops often laid in wait to ambush dust off choppers that were sure to come for the wounded. Most crews simply prepared for the worst while maintaining a firm sense of resolve to get in and out regardless of the danger. Security of an area made no sense at all. Somebody had shot those guys you were gonna go get and he had been shot just a few minutes before and that's why you were going in there. For some guy on the ground to be forced to tell you it's secure or insecure was an unfair burden on that guy. He wanted him out and he wanted him out now. And who in the hell are we to say that we can't go into an insecure area when those guys live in insecure areas? While most crews were willing to take enormous risks, their ability to assess the real level of threat was often complicated by the emotional stress of the men they were trying to help. The agony of helplessly waiting with wounded comrades who were in great pain and who might not survive led many men to underestimate enemy threats for fear that dust-off crews would shy away from the mission. All crews felt a great deal of empathy for the plight of the men on the ground, but they also worked hard to convince troops that accurate threat information was vital to the interests of everyone involved. I knew from so many missions the anguish of this man down there that has people that, that he knows and he wants out of there because they're dying. And if he forgets to tell you that, uh, that the enemy is within 200 yards and, uh, and you ask and he says, well, there it's been light contact when in effect it's been heavy, you know, you understand that. And uh, after a while, he, you, you sort of accept this. They will lie to you, as would I, to get you to come for their wounded buddy. And that's the worst thing you can have, because you come in there fat, dumb, and happy, and then the first thing you hear, boom, somebody sh somebody's shot on your aircraft. So I said, don't talk to me about security. Here's all I ask. If you will stand up, when we land and help us load the patient, I'll come in. Just give me a break on location and uh, weaponry of the enemy. I'm gonna turn my tail into the fire, get him on as quick as you can so we can get out with everybody alive. Helicopter operations in Vietnam were notoriously demanding. Flight crews were confronted with virtually every type of terrain imaginable. Landing zones, or LZs, were often nothing more than small clearings carved out of the jungle. Merely bringing a chopper into a low hover in the rough, unforgiving terrain taxed even the most accomplished pilots. To make matters worse, Enemy forces frequently booby-trapped potential LZs, 
or set up deadly ambushes. Dust-off pilots faced even worse conditions than most crews. When called in to recover wounded troops, they usually flew into an area where enemy forces were nearby, and often, the unit they were coming to help was still involved in active combat. As a result, the entire dust-off crew had to be prepared for virtually any contingency as they approached a pickup area. Uh, dust off 7-4, this is Matthew 6-5, Bill. This is Dust off 7-4, we're approaching your area from the north at this time. Bob, your smoke at this time, what's your recommended approach into the area and what is your security? Uh, Roger, we are popping smoke at this time. Recommended direction of approach is from north to south. Tactical situation in, the area is secure. One of the things we learned early on was that the enemy listened to us on the frequency. We had only one frequency that we all used, it was dedicated to medical evacuation. And the guy on the ground would say, dust off, I'm popping yellow smoke. And then there'd be four or five yellow smokes down there. So we got smart and we said, all right, you pop your smoke and I will identify it. There's dust off the seventh floor, there's been an approach from north to south. I have green smoke. Uh, Roger, that's a problem. We have green smoke, and your direction approach is a problem. That's dust off seven four. I'm on final approach at this time. Let him know. Uh, Roger, we have someone out there to guide you in. Seven four. Okay, lock and load. We're on final approach at this time. Pick up the head rolls on the left and right. Area is secure. We'll go in as attack security is not secure. Pick up head rolls left and right. Final approach. Every evacuation attempt was filled with uncertainty and danger. Ground troops frequently had to carry their wounded a considerable distance over rugged terrain until they could find a large enough clearing for dust-off's chopper. Each clearing was different and posed dozens of new and unique threats. It was the aircraft commander's job to negotiate these ever-changing risks. In time, though, repeated exposure to such demanding flight conditions led many pilots to develop a sixth sense for finding the best way in and out of virtually any area. As I learned to analyze the terrain, the aircraft capabilities, the enemy location, friendly location, the weaponry that we were up against, if you put that all in your mind and just kind of mixed it together, a highway would actually spring out of the sky and it would just take you in there in the safest possible way. Helicopter crews were usually ambushed when they were most vulnerable, when they were just settling into a hover or were resting on the ground. Once in the landing zone, the key to safety was speed, and the key to speed was teamwork. The crew chief and the medic quickly loaded or supervised the loading of patients while the pilot waited for the signal to take off. Every second counted. We tried to rely on speed so that we would minimize our time within the range of the enemy. And the hardest part of the mission, I suppose, from a pilot's point of view, is the fact that you were there on the ground, stationary. You were not flying anymore, not until all the wounded were placed on board. And even though it was an experience that might have lasted maybe 15 seconds at the most, I assure you, it felt more like 15 minutes. While moments spent in any LZ seemed to last for an eternity, nothing could compare to the challenge of evacuations from areas that were completely inaccessible. To recover patients in rough or waterlogged terrain, the pilot came into a hover directly above the wounded. The crew then lowered a 250-foot cable from a hoist powered by an electric winch. If the patient was seriously wounded, he was placed in a Stokes rigid litter so that he could gently be raised to the crew. In a combat zone, nothing is more vulnerable than a helicopter maintaining a high hover. No matter what happened, the crew had to hold that hover until the patient was safely on board. 
It was often impossible to lower a litter because of dense jungle foliage. To solve this problem, a bullet-shaped jungle penetrator equipped with straps and three paddle-like seats was often lowered so that the patient could be extracted through the trees. It took everyone in the crew to perform these hazardous missions. One false move could result in tragedy for the patient, the crew, and even the troops below. Most times the crew would lay on the floor uh, looking out the door, trying to stay on a reference point and keep the thing steady over a small hole in triple canopy jungle where you would lower uh, a jungle penetrator or a stokes litter or something like that where they could then load the patient on you pull him up through the trees without hooking him on trees. I have been on hoist missions where you couldn't get to the ground but you could come down in the trees, move over another layer and you'd look up and there would actually be trees over the top of you while you're dropping a hoist down to pull the patients up. In 1967, dust off evacuated almost 1,400 patients on hoist missions. Nearly 100,000 wounded were evacuated overall, but success came with a high price. That same year, 40 crewmen were killed, 58 were wounded, and 24 helicopters, clearly marked with big red crosses, were lost in action. According to terms established by the Geneva Convention, medical evacuation helicopters were not to carry arms or to engage in combat. But these terms also stipulated that medical evacuation personnel were not to be fired upon. In Vietnam, both of these mandates were often ignored. In some cases, Formal defensive measures were taken to protect crews, such as adding door gunners and requesting gunship escorts. I worked hard to, to make sure my medics were armed, not only with a uh, rifle, but with a pistol, because they had to leave the helicopter and they couldn't take the rifle and carry a patient at the same time. So they had to have a sidearm for protection. The brutal and unpredictable nature of combat in Vietnam proved time and again that arming dust-off crews was a practical approach to a life-and-death situation. Even when crews were armed, though, there was often little they could do to defend against the perfectly timed ambushes of a well-concealed enemy, a situation Major Pat Brady once encountered as he settled in for a routine pickup. We were called into a secure area, came in over the trees, sat down in the area, and two NVA or VC came up out of spider traps and shot both my crew members right in the door. And the one crew member is hanging in his uh, harness, and I was sure he was dead, and the other one was shot in the back. And this guy, a kid named Steve Hook, marvelous medic, as I look back, he's crawling through the stacks of patients, trying to start IVs, stop the bleeding, establish airways to see that people are going to make it for that 15 or 20 minutes. But he's shot in the back, and he's bleeding. And I'm afraid he's going to bleed out. And so I grabbed a, a, one of the patients, and I pointed to his back and to his first aid pouch. And so he took out his pouch. While Hook is treating the patient, this guy was treating Hook. By 1968, dust-off crews knew that they were flying the most dangerous missions in all of South Vietnam. Despite the tremendous risk the men faced, they forged ahead with a sense of purpose that astonished many and earned them heartfelt respect and admiration from Allied forces and civilians throughout the country. The tradition and mystique that men like Major Charles Kelly had started continued to deepen until it became an obsession that drove hundreds of pilots to perform thousands of miraculous feats. Many more crews would die in the rice paddies and jungles of Vietnam. But theirs was a noble cause, one that was worth fighting and potentially dying for. Kelly's doctrine for dust off said it all. No compromise, no rationalization, no hesitation, fly the mission now the thing you feared most was that you weren't going to be able to get the guy out 
that somehow or another uh, you couldn't get through the weather, somehow or another you couldn't get into the area, somehow or another the enemy action would stop you, something. Once you got the patient on board, then you just take a, a sigh of relief, and uh, now it's just a matter of minutes before he's in the hands of a physician, and he's going to live. Throughout 1968, the number of dust-off missions increased dramatically. In just 12 days, during the Communists' January Tet Offensive, crews evacuated over 8,000 patients with only 64 helicopters, 40 of which were hit by enemy fire. By year's end, more than 200,000 wounded were recovered. Dust-off's commitment to recovering the wounded as fast as possible drove crews to log incredible flight hours, despite limited resources and personnel. Generally speaking, our shifts were 12 hours. And it was conceivable that you would be flying almost all the time that you were on duty. It's one mission after another, and you don't, you don't shut down. You refuel hot, and then you say, nurses, for God's sakes, give us some chocolate chip cookies or some chocolate milk, which was a good, great thing over there. And, and, uh, or a sandwich or something, and they would run out and stick a sandwich in the window as you dropped off the patients and went back out on the next mission. Dustoff's ability to continue operating at such a pace was dependent on the skill and dedication of each team's crew chief. Damage from enemy fire and the strain of constant flying took a serious toll on Dustoff Hueys. Overall, the cumulative stress of such frantic operations had a tremendous impact on the entire crew. The constant vibration, deafening noise, and intense concentration associated with helicopter operations led the Army to formally restrict pilots to four hours of flight time per day. For many in the dust-off community, though, the idea of restricting flight time as a safety precaution when there were men in the field who desperately needed their help simply seemed absurd. They tried to stop us in Kelly's time because the standard was like 90 hours a month. And Kelly said, well, what do you want me to do when my pilots reach 90 hours in a month? We just leave the guy in the field? What are we gonna do? 90 hours in a month is nothing. And we just ignored that. We flew until we got through. Dustoff was frequently swamped with frantic calls for medical evacuation during major actions. To keep pace, multiple pickups were often made during a single mission. The size and strength of later model Hueys allowed crews to load up to six patients on hanging litters or nine without. In desperation though, crews often loaded on a dozen or more men in an effort to recover and stabilize as many as they could as fast as they could. In a combat situation, we never put the patient on a litter. And I don't care how bad a guy is, unless it's a head or a neck injury, something like that, and unless you've got time, there was no need to put him on there. We're gonna have you in an operating room in 15 or 20 minutes. That's the important thing, not to take time to load a litter. You wanted to get as many as you could and as few trips as possible. The speed of recovery meant the difference between life and death for thousands of wounded. More than 97% of all patients airlifted from combat survived. The race to recover the wounded was fueled by an ever-present fear that the crew wouldn't make it in time. No words could describe the agony of descending into a pickup area where men were standing motionless by wounded comrades and realizing that it was too late. Such fears drove crews to take extraordinary risks to make combat pickups. Over time, dust-off pilots developed their own encyclopedia of combat flight tactics, clever tricks of the trade that were instinctively devised in the heat of battle by men like Major Patrick Brady and then passed on to future crews. One day we got a mission and it's out in a valley 
and they had a bunch of casualties there. And the, the VC were mortaring the people on the ground, and they clearly had the strip zeroed in. So I says, all right, you put the patients at the north end of the strip, have them all ready to get on the aircraft as soon as I land, but I'm gonna land at the south end of the strip. So I landed on the south end of the strip and I sat there as long as I could stand it, figuring how long it takes the guy to get the mortar set up, zeroed in, and then zip. We scooted towards the other end of the strip, got the patients on it, and got out. Statistics for 1969 reflect the incredible pace of evacuation operations and the skill, courage, and stamina of dust-off crews. In all, more than 241,000 wounded were evacuated during some 120,000 missions. During one long day, Chief Warrant Officer Mike Novosel and his crew managed to evacuate 66 Americans from the 1st Infantry Division who had been caught in a bloody ambush. On another afternoon, despite having already flown for seven hours, his crew managed to extract 29 severely wounded Vietnamese troops while under heavy fire, a mission for which Novacell was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. During one rescue attempt, his radios and instruments were shot out, and on the last pickup, Novacell himself was wounded. Such a frantic race for life left little time for crews to properly prepare for the next mission let alone to contemplate the brutality of what they faced each day. More than once I had my helicopter deck awash in blood and I didn't have the time to wash it off. If I'd have wasted that time to wash it off, someone else would have died. And that, that's, uh, that's the hard part. Of all the forces who served in Vietnam, none bore witness to more of the war's brutality than the medics and crew chiefs of dust off. The pace of operations, the wide variety and severity of injuries, and the volume of patients were perhaps the most demanding in the history of combat medicine. It took a special breed of men to face the kind of carnage that dust off medics were confronted with each and every day. The medic was a unique medic uh, this guy had to have immediate life-saving skills. He dealt all day with traumatic injuries, amputations, head, neck, chest wounds, very serious uh, mutilation of the human body. Medics and crew chiefs had to be prepared for the very worst each time they set off on a mission. Regardless of what information the crew received in advance of entering a pickup area, the situation on the ground was usually very different, and in many cases, much worse. Dust-off choppers were frequently called in to areas where firefights still raged. Specifics regarding the wounded were often unavailable until the men were actually on the ground. You're aware of, of, of approximate number of casualties. Outside of that, it was generally a surprise. It was like walking up to a buffet. It was like you got wounded from A to Z, so you, you had no idea what to prepare for. The rapid response of dust-off crews and the severity of injuries produced by unconventional warfare posed tremendous challenges for dust-off. Many recently recruited medics had only received cursory training in traditional combat medicine. At times, even the most seasoned dust-off medics were hard-pressed to effectively treat those who had recently been maimed in combat or by lethal Viet Cong booby traps. We were picking up people who were just freshly shot, whereas in Korea, these people were probably dead by the time the helicopter got there. But now the helicopter's picking them up, 
minutes after they were shot, minutes after the mine went off and half of their face is missing. And so consequently, the medic on the helicopter was faced with, with casualties that the training wasn't aware of. Combat triage was extremely stressful for dust-off medics. When there were more casualties than space would allow, decisions about who could be saved, who could wait, and who would not make it had to be made as fast as possible. Every second counted, not only for the seriously wounded, but for the rest of the crew, who became prime targets for enemy gunners as they sat idle in the LZ. Once on board, the medic and the crew chief continued the struggle to assign priorities and to stabilize all of the wounded. Cramped quarters, the anxiety of patients, and the wide variety of wounds complicated the triage process immensely. Incorrect assumptions about the severity of a man's condition could easily lead to a death that could have been prevented. There would be people um, that just had just a small little hole, didn't even bleed. And we had a, it, the man was dead, and here's this person that was half the chest uh, blown up, and this guy would hang on and live and go walk right out. In a combat situation, medics rarely had the luxury of properly treating and dressing wounds. Instead, they often had to resort to crude but effective measures, literally keeping people alive with their bare hands until the crew was out of danger. If we were getting shot at, you didn't have time to worry about, do you have enough equipment? You, you hold the bleeding, you stop the bleeding. Uh, you might not have gloves, you might not have anything. Just grab the wound with your hands and hold it until you could get out of the area and then uh, do something about, uh, you know, whether you clamped or uh, put pressure dressings on or whatever. Dust off evacuation was not reserved just for American forces. In fact, crews evacuated thousands of friendly troops, Vietnamese civilians, and even wounded Viet Cong and North Vietnamese prisoners. Security for the evacuation of enemy forces was always a paramount concern. Nonetheless, dust off crews made every effort to treat wounded enemy troops with the same determination that they would wounded Americans, keeping with a long tradition of medical personnel to sustain all life, whether friend or foe. I had a Viet Cong uh, who was in very sad shape and uh, a friendly who just had a minor flesh wound. I'd take care of the, of the more severe injury first. I didn't, to me, I didn't really care if, if uh, I didn't care if they were white skin or yellow skin or what color flag they fought under. Once they're in my care, a patient is a patient. And I don't, I don't worry about politics, race, religion, or any of that stuff. A patient is a patient. It is hard to comprehend what the dust-off medic, and indeed the entire crew, confronted on a daily basis. Combat operations in Vietnam often instilled horrific images of pain and suffering in the minds of those who witnessed them. Perhaps nowhere were these images as graphic nor as incessant as they were for the crews of dust-off. There are some bizarre things that, that you see that land in a, in a field and, and the mortars start landing in, and you see a guy half blown up still take a couple of steps. And you're saying, here comes. This isn't really happening. Repeated exposure to such carnage could have an extremely traumatic impact on dust off crews. Yet most crewmen were able to persevere. They knew that the lives of literally thousands of young men hung in the balance of their ability to remain calm and to administer the very best care that they could under the circumstances.
When every day you see traumatic amputations, sucking chest wounds, bullet wounds, severe head wounds where part of the brain is coming out. When you see this on, a, on, on an almost daily basis, it, it, it has that effect that uh, you get to expect that that's what you're going to see. And uh, if, if you allow it to bother you, you're in the wrong business. You better move somewhere else because you're not going to be very good. You have to take it and you have to accept it as a course of life at, at that point. The pilots, medics, and crew chiefs that served on board dust-off choppers had all volunteered to be assigned to their units. Many not only finished their initial assignments, but volunteered to stay on for multiple tours. For some, though, the incredible stress of dust-off operations eventually became too much. When it did, there was an unspoken bond among all crews that reflected both the admirable contribution that had been made and the painful trials that were endured by all. We had people who would just quit. And, uh, and we never, never said anything about it. You know, there was no disgrace attached to it. There was no humility attached to it. We saw the human body in every possible configuration, uh, thousands and thousands of dead. You would never force a guy to do the kind of work we did. From 1962 until the end of American involvement in 1973, dust-off crews evacuated more than 900,000 patients to various medical facilities throughout Vietnam. The vast majority of patients arrived less than an hour after they were wounded, and more than 97% ultimately survived. Much of the credit for such a low mortality rate belongs to the surgeons and staff of evacuation hospitals that often performed medical miracles. But before the wounded could be saved, there had to be men brave enough to go and get them. Roughly one-third of all dust-off pilots became casualties in their efforts to recover the wounded. In all, 297 crewmen were killed, hundreds more were wounded, and nearly 200 helicopters were lost in action. While some questioned Dustoff's willingness to put their own lives on the line for the wounded, most crews couldn't fathom performing their missions in any other way. When it comes to the bottom line of whether you risk it, you and your helicopter for the wounded, war is a risky business. This guy down there has risked himself. Why in the hell wouldn't you risk yourself? People I, I know would certainly not have survived if we hadn't been there, we, that we know. And when it was all over, there is a great feeling that it, it's, it's, it's almost a high that you know, man, I have saved somebody today. The Grim Reaper was watching me, but I fooled him. No words or statistics can ever really capture the contributions and sacrifices of dust-off in Vietnam. In the end, the only legacy worthy of their achievements is a living legacy. The gratitude of thousands of men like pilot John Gavan, who never would have made it home alive without the immediate care he received from a dust-off crew. These are the most selfless people in the world. They would give their life for a wounded American or Vietnamese without a second thought.
immensely under Kelly's command. Dustoff came to represent a ray of humanity and hope in an increasingly brutal and inhumane conflict. They set a standard that will be hard to match in anybody's war. It gave us a very strong feeling of security, knowing those medevac guys would be in there to get us. We loved them to death. And we knew particularly that Major Charles L. Kelly would be there. People appreciated him very much because they didn't have to wait till morning uh, to get their people out. And they knew he would come anytime, day or night, whatever the weather was, they didn't have to wait. And that's a great thing for a person to know if there's somebody next to you that's hurt. In a letter to the U.S. Surgeon General, Kelly described the commitment of dust-off crews to their cause. Our job is evacuation of casualties from the battlefield, he wrote. This we are doing day and night, without escort aircraft, and with only one ship for each mission. The other units fly in groups, rarely at night, and are always heavily armed. The strength of Kelly's determination to keep dust off in the air and his dedication to the wounded on the ground were clear in the daring way he flew. This was the case on July 1st, 1964, when a call for dust off came from a unit near Vin Long. Approaching the area, Kelly radioed the men on the ground and asked them to mark their position with smoke. As he neared the ground, enemy forces turned their weapons on the large, vulnerable Huey. The advisors on the ground frantically radioed Kelly, warning him to get out of the area as fast as possible. When I have your wounded, he answered. Suddenly, Kelly's Huey pitched upwards, nosed over, and plunged to the earth, the rotors beating into the ground. My God, he whispered, as a bullet entered an open cargo door and pierced his heart. Major Charles L. Kelly was the 49th American to die in Vietnam. But his legacy would live on for years to come. Major Charles Kelly did not die in vain. At the time of his death, roughly 18,000 U.S. troops were stationed in Vietnam. By the end of 1966, nearly 400,000 American troops were stationed throughout the country, and the conflict was becoming increasingly bloody. Ultimately, millions of military and civilian personnel would be wounded or killed in a bitter struggle that would last more than a decade. Major Kelly's sacrifice was greeted throughout South Vietnam and the United States by an outpouring of praise and honor that ensured the continued existence of dust-off. His legacy for the conduct of dust-off operations could be summed up by some of the last words he spoke, when I have your wounded, a motto that men like Major Patrick Brady, one of two dust-off pilots to receive the Medal of Honor, took to heart. Raider Alpha 6, Raider Alpha 6, long dust off. The operation shack would get the mission. Well, as soon as the guy came on the radio, dust off, have a mission ready to copy. He'd hit the buzzer, and that alerted the crew, and immediately the co-pilot would head for the aircraft. The pilot would head for the operation shack, and you didn't walk, you ran. And uh, the first thing you wanted was the coordinates and a heading, and with those two bits of information, he would run to the aircraft which would already be running. Co-pilot was started. Everything was ready to go. You're off the ground before three minutes, and you call the guy on the ground right now, as soon as you break ground, because then he stops keeping time. He knows you're on the way. He then is relieved.
Initially, dust-off pilots essentially abandon conventional combat flight precautions in an effort to get to the wounded as fast as possible. Even if there had been time to receive it, information about the location and strength of enemy threats and the number and type of casualties was often unavailable. The only intelligence that we had was that which we found out along the way. We had no intelligence briefing. There wasn't, a, there wasn't time for an intelligence briefing. There wasn't time for flight planning. In the absence of intelligence about enemy threats, pilots developed their own set of defensive flight tactics. Many preferred to fly at treetop level en route to the pickup area. This prevented enemy gunners from finding their mark. Dust-off crews became renowned for their willingness to fly by the seat of their pants, directly into active combat, even at night or in bad weather. In time, the situation improved slightly. Crews began receiving what became known as the essential elements of information. We would be able to write down on a piece of paper the location, radio call sign, radio frequency, number and type of patients, security of the area, physical condition of the area, all these kinds of things that are nice to know if you are a pilot. Although such information was extremely helpful in theory, dust-off crews still had to venture into the unknown virtually every time they set off on a mission. One of the most significant problems lay in the fact that men who were immersed in the confusion and trauma of combat were often prone to providing inaccurate information. Oftentimes, the guy on the ground didn't know where he was. And he'd give you a set of coordinates uh, that, you know, you get there, he is nobody there. While crews could usually pinpoint the location of troops by homing in on their radio signal, there were other more significant problems. One of the most difficult involved the prioritization of patients. Various categories of precedence, ranging from urgent to priority to routine, were supposed to be assigned to patients based on the length of time that they would likely be able to survive. In reality, though, many patients drew urgent classifications based on their pain rather than on the severity of their condition. Ground commanders were anxious to see that any wounded man was taken out as soon as possible. This often limited Dustoff's ability to evacuate those who needed help most. It made no sense at all. You know, you could have both legs blown off and not necessarily be urgent, because your limbs are gone already, and if you're stable, you live for a long time. So. I said there are two kinds of patients, an urgent patient and a non-urgent patient. Now, if you got them day or night, we're going to come and get them right now. But we need to know urgent or non-urgent so that we can, in fact, best allocate our resources. The security of a pickup area was perhaps the most bewildering information that dust off received from the field. Ground troops were supposed to assess security so that the crews could determine how or even if they could get in and out of an area safely. But every crew knew that ground forces were hard pressed to assess the relative security of any area. They also knew that enemy troops often laid in wait to ambush dust-off choppers that were sure to come for the wounded. Most crews simply prepared for the worst, while maintaining a firm sense of resolve to get in and out regardless of the danger. Security of an area made no sense at all. Somebody had shot those guys you were going to go get, and he had been shot just a few minutes before, and that's why you were going in there. For some guy on the ground to be forced to tell you it's secure or insecure was an unfair burden on that guy. He wanted him out, and he wanted him out now. And who in the hell are we to say that we can't go into an insecure area when those guys live in insecure areas? While most crews were willing to take enormous risks, 
their ability to assess the real level of threat was often complicated by the emotional stress of the men they were trying to help. The agony of helplessly waiting with wounded comrades who were in great pain and who might not survive led many men to underestimate enemy threats for fear that dust-off crews would shy away from the mission. All crews felt a great deal of empathy for the plight of the men on the ground, but they also worked hard to convince troops that accurate threat information was vital to the interests of everyone involved. I knew from so many missions the anguish of this man down there that has people that, that he knows and he wants out of there because they're dying. And if he forgets to tell you that, uh, that the enemy is within 200 yards and, uh, and you ask and he says, well, there has been light contact when in effect it's been heavy, you know, you under Among the millions of casualties produced in the Vietnam War, more than 900,000 survived their injuries thanks to the uncommon dedication and bravery of a relatively small group of men known as Dust Off. They flew the most dangerous missions in South Vietnam to evacuate wounded troops from the battlefield and to keep them alive long enough to receive more thorough medical care. This is the incredible story of the men who volunteered to fly those missions, the dangers they faced, sacrifices they made, pain they suffered, and the lives they saved. In Vietnam, all helicopter pilots followed one golden rule. Never fly over the same area twice, especially if you had come under fire the first time. That rule was especially true for landing zones, or LZs, where enemy troops routinely ambushed vulnerable chopper crews. On April 12, 1964, that rule was defied with tragic consequences for a young H-21 pilot named John Givan. That day, Lieutenant Givan was transporting a load of South Vietnamese troops to a district capital that had been taken over by communist Viet Cong forces. As soon as the troops had been offloaded, the empty transport struggled to regain altitude, but then spun around and flew directly across the LZ. The fire directed on us by the VC was overwhelming. You could hear it, it just like popcorn machines going off everywhere. At about the time the altimeter read 400 feet, I thought, this is too good to be true. We might make it. Well, just a few seconds after that, literally, everything from just about right here below my knee uh, was in little bitty pieces of meat, bone, and blood dripping from the top of the cockpit. Givan was rushed to a nearby staging area in a dust-off chopper piloted by Major Charles Kelly. The crew was met by Captain James Ralph, a flight surgeon who recognized the severity of Givan's condition and immediately began treating his wounds. This footage was taken as the men frantically prepared to evacuate Givan to Saigon. The um, uh, artery had retracted up into his Fine. There's no way I could get to it, nothing I could clamp, so I had to pack several gauze dressings in there and just hold them with my thumbs. We um, took off, went to altitude, and, and he passed out. He was kind of in and out of it anyway, but he just went from um, white to gray at that point. I told the pilot, we got to stay at treetop level. The pilot, Major Kelly, descended to preserve what little oxygen flow remained in Gavan's bloodstream. The entire crew was now at risk of coming under fire from enemy gunners. Givan had a slim chance of surviving, but only if his condition could be stabilized and if he could receive thorough trauma care within minutes. In a desperate attempt to reduce blood loss, 
Captain Ralph continued to grasp Gavan's open wound until he was in surgery. He was the closest to dying of anyone I, I took care of in, in Vietnam. He was just, uh, he was worse than pale. He was turning gray. He had, had no, no pulse that you could feel. Unfortunately, the damage to the lower portion of Gavan's right leg was beyond repair. But thanks to the incredible skill and courage of a dust-off crew and the extraordinary efforts of the surgeons and medical staff that attended to his wounds, Gavan's life was saved. During the Korean War, the air ambulance concept was a proven success. And the dust-off helicopter, the Bell UH-1 Huey, was designed especially for medical evacuation. But there was a time when these dedicated dust-off helicopters in Vietnam were almost grounded. That was before Major Charles Kelly, the pilot who evacuated Lieutenant Gavan, arrived in country in January of 1964. Kelly was the third commander of the 57th Medical Detachment, a small field evacuation unit that was sent to Vietnam in early 62. When he took command, the unit was virtually under siege by senior level brass. They thought that a dedicated unit of air ambulances was a waste of a most precious commodity, helicopters. Kelly's first order of business was to confront the unit's detractors and to prove them wrong. Kelly came back to us and he says, let me tell you something, they don't wish us well. They want our aircraft. So the only way we're gonna keep them is to prove that nobody else can do what we do better than we do. The 57th had amassed an impressive record of evacuations, despite numerous political and operational obstacles. But Kelly instilled a new sense of urgency in crews and made several dramatic operational changes. First, Kelly taught his crews never to refuse a mission never to come home without the patient, and always to put the safety of the wounded first. He then split the detachment and relocated two of the choppers to Sok Trang, in the middle of Vietnam's expansive delta, where Viet Cong activity was rapidly increasing. Radio communication was extremely unreliable, so Kelly directed his crews not just to wait for evacuation requests, but to actually seek out new business. In an extremely bold move, Kelly himself also began flying at night. Each evening, he set off on a 400-mile circuit to recover wounded troops and civilians that he knew would be out there. Frequently, he arrived home in a chopper that was full of holes and spurting gas. Most pilots were soon flying more than 150 hours a month, even though they were supposed to be grounded if they flew more than 100. The value and appreciation of dust-off crews 